Okay, so we're going to start off now. So good morning, everybody, um, and welcome to the Thames Valley Chamber of Commerce and today's webinar, which is on Is Workplace Mental Health Broken? I'm Narinda Multani, Account Manager here at the Thames Valley Chamber of Commerce. So I'm your host for today and my member, Sheila Lord of BMR Health and Wellbeing, uh, will be delivering today's webinar, which is being recorded and is available to listen to again via the Chamber webinar library. Um, so if you do have any questions for Sheila, please do post them in the chat box and then Sheila will answer those for you as we go along. So I'm um, just going to pass you over to Sheila, who will introduce herself and will commence with today's webinar. So thank you, Sheila. Let me tell me myself first. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Narinda. Um, good morning, everybody. And just want to say thank you um, for joining um, me today, along with the Thames Valley Chamber. Um, I mean, the title of the presentation today is, is Workplace Mental Health Broken. And I think, I don't necessarily think that it's broken per se, but I think there is actually a hell of a lot more that we can be doing, um, especially in the UK, uh, around this subject matter. Now, um, let me just see if I can move these slides along, because, ah, excellent. Okay, so, so about BMR, we are BMR, that stands for Building Mental Resilience, and that's what we want to look at doing um, within the workplace. So we're an, an independent mental health training uh, and consultancy business, um, and we, deliver a series of kind of workshops um, around mental health in the workplace, uh, including um, the MHFA England training. Um, but we saw that that actually wasn't quite enough in terms of addressing workplace mental health. And I'll come on to that um, a little bit more. Um, we've recently partnered um, with a company in Australia, um, that is Flourish DX. Um, and the reason for that initiative and for that partnership was to look at um, addressing workplace um, mental health in a more um, systemic and data driven way. Now, as far as the law is concerned, there is a legal case um, for us as employers to tackle work-related stress. Um, so we've got a general duty to look after our employees under the Health and Safety at Work Act and the Health and Safety Regulations. So, you know, as an employer, we have a duty to identify and mitigate risk. Um, and there's further protection again for employers under the Equalities Act 2010. So it can make it unlawful for us as employers to discriminate against um, employees um, because of a mental disability in the same way that it would be for a physical disability. So one of the questions I like to ask, and if you can maybe put your answers in the chat or unmute yourselves, is, um, and it's really weird because I can't see any of you on the screen, um, is basically what... sorry Sheila it's it's yeah there won't be anybody on the screen it's all just about putting it into the chat box okay no problem. it's just us two that are on here today all right no problem. okay so yeah so one of the things I'd like to understand is what comes to mind first of all for you when um I say what is mental health and I can't see the chat there at all, Narinda. So, ah, well being. Okay, thank you, Peter. Anybody else? I mean, typically, what, what most people respond when I ask this question, and we, we ran this webinar last week um, as well, and nearly everybody answered things like stress, anxiety, depression, psychosis. Uh, and schizophrenia um, and that's really interesting because a lot of the time when we talk about mental health um, people think of mental illness and not actually um, mental health so as we all know mental uh, if you've done any of the of the mental health awareness training and certainly any of the MHFA training that um, mental health is a continuum and we will move around that continuum um, all the time throughout various stages of our life and we'll, we'll move from um, flourishing to being mentally well to you know having a bad day or potentially being diagnosed with some sort of um, mental illness or disorder and what I want to look at today is this integrated model of workplace mental health 
Um, so the end of the screen is not moving forward. Can you move the slide deck forward, Namanda? Yeah, you do have remote control access. There might be a bit of a delay. Is that the right uh, slide? Go. Yeah, that's the right side. So um, what I wanted to look at here is where we are in the UK um, in terms of how we approach workplace mental health. Actually, that's not the right slide. It needs to be further forward. Forward. That's the one. Okay. So when we're looking at um, workplace mental health, we've got this continuum here. Okay. So I've talked about, you know, while we can be flourishing in terms of where we are on the continuum, we're in a period of mental wellness. We might be struggling a bit and we might be getting to this point where we've got a mental disorder. Now, a lot of you um, on the call will probably be aware of the approach that we take in the UK a lot, which is this mitigating illness piece. Now, in terms of mitigating illness, what are we doing there? Well, we have programmes around workplace wellbeing, which would be uh, employee assistance programmes. So EAP um, is becoming pretty much a de facto standard within the workplace in terms of um, um, having support services for employees. And then we've got mental health first aid training. So let's get that awareness piece going in the workplace. Um, some of you may have um, specific return to work policies all around um, physical injury, but how many you have separate policies relating to psychological injury? So a lot of what we do in the workspace um, currently, um, and since it became such a kind of big topic in, in, in the UK and, and, and in the workplace, is this mitigating illness piece. All of this is designed to pick you up once you have fallen. Um, and for me, I don't see that that is the right approach. It's great that we've got it there, but what are we doing to prevent people from falling over in the first place? Now, again, some, some organizations do this very well, um, but I think essentially across most of the UK, um, especially in a lot of kind of smaller medium organizations, knowing where to start, can often be difficult and in terms of kind of trying to promote a flourishing environment at work in terms of trying to um, put some health promotion activities in place um, what we tend to do um, is look at things like fruit bowls we'll look at yoga we'll look at exercise but the big piece for me that's really missing in terms of workplace mental health is this bit in the middle um, which is risk management and stress management. We're doing some of the education stuff with the MHFA, but again, with the education, are we educating company-wide or are we just educating those two, three, four, six mental health first aiders that we might have within the organisation? So how are we getting that message out um, across the whole business? Um, can I mean, just again, if anyone can just drop me something in the chat, you know, does anybody currently risk have, a, have an approach of risk management around mental health in the workplace? It'd be interesting for me to understand that. No, that's Rachel. Okay, no, no. Um, and I think that's not uncommon um, because how do we do that um, in the workplace? Um, so as I said before, what's usually done is more focused around illness rather than risk management, but how do we go about identifying those stresses um, in the workplace? Navinda, I don't seem to have control of the slide deck. There will be a delay. Um, if you, oh, I've clicked it for you. But okay, could you click it again, please? Yeah, can you see at the bottom, there's the, um, just over here where I'm hovering over, can you see? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. At the bottom? Click on those. Yeah. No. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, I'll, right. I'll try and move those for you. Thank you. So, yeah, so we've talked about workplace mental health is often done is, you know, we'll, we may have exercise classes, we may have meditations and yoga, uh, we may have nutrition, but how do we know that this is having any desired impact in terms of what we're doing? How are we going to identify um, the hazards in the workplace um, that can contribute to psychological injury and can contribute to STEF? 
uh, to stress. Um, and how do we look to manage that over time? Um, so we can move on to the next slide, please, Melinda. So what I want to look at here is what is a psychologically healthy workplace? OK, and I say psychologically healthy because I'd like to try and change our mindset and our uh, understanding of what workplace mental health should be and what it should look like. Um, because a psychologically healthy workplace is one that will actually promote workers' psychological well-being and work to prevent harm. Um, and those are two key statements and they're two very action oriented statement that puts an onus on the employer to do something. So it's not just about doing a bit of well-being promotion, it's about looking at um, how we can prevent harm from happening to workers in the first place. Um, so it's a combination of the promotion and the health promotion activities and this risk assessment piece. OK, um, so what we're looking to be able to do, if we look at this bottom diagram here, is to identify hazards in the workplace, to assess risks, to control risks and review and control those measures. And that's what we need to be doing as employers. Um, but as a total um, workplace mental health solution, you know, there is also a responsibility from the employee as well. So you can create the best workplace environment um, ever, but if employees are still not taking some level of personal responsibility um, for their own well-being, then we're going to struggle. So if we look at this other circle here, you know, an employer's responsibility is to do this preventing harm, promoting flourishing and mitigating illness. But from an employee perspective, how do we support them in terms of positive emotions in terms of engagement, relationships, meaningfulness of work, a sense of accomplishment, and also another factor that affects us within in terms of our mental well-being um, is sleep. So if I was to ask you um, what is a psychological hazard in the workplace, would anybody be able to tell me something in the chat there? What you think is a psychological hazard in the workplace? that could contribute to stress. Bully and David, yep, that's absolutely one of them. Workload, yep, that's another. High work, lack of control, so yeah, autonomy over the tasks there. So, you, you know, there's, we can see that there are definite psychological hazards that exist in the workplace. Um, Narinda, could you go on to the next slide, please? OK, and these are the psychosocial hazards. OK, so we've, you know, somebody's already mentioned workload and autonomy. Um, another one is clarity of roles. You know, if there's confusion over, the, you know, what people are supposed to be doing. Again, another factor for stress. Um, again, lack of support in the workplace. So are we getting the right support from management? Um, are we getting the right support in respect of training um, relationships? That, you know, also ties in with bullying, that ties in with harassment, how is relationship conflict dealt with, and also reward and recognition for the job that we're doing. Um, and again, you know, we've all been through this, you know, when, when organisations want to make some kind of change within the business, if that change isn't communicated well, if that change isn't consulted, that can cause stress. Um, and again, this organisational justice piece, you know, it's all right for sales, they always get this, they always get that. So how is the organisation perceived in terms of fairness um, across the business? Um, and when we're looking at these hazards, we need to be able to start to kind of risk manage them and understand what these are um, and treat them as you would um, a physical hazard. So with a physical hazard in the workplace, you'll have a health and safety committee. Um, there'd be consultation with staff. There would be a representative within the organisation. Um, and we need to be doing the same around psychosocial hazards. Um, so how would we look to identify them? This is one of the reasons we partnered with the platform um, in um, Australia with the Flourish DX platform. Within that platform, we have a survey which is called the Work Design Survey. Okay, and this is a way to um, identify the, the hazards anonymously 
across the organisation at an aggregate level. Um, and I'll come on to that in a little bit more um, detail as we move through the presentation. So what I want to do next is look at the next slide and look at actually the size of the problem. And some of you, again, will be aware of some of the statistics that um, will come on the next slide. Yeah, I'm just going to move over to the next <laughs> slide. Just a quick question, um, yeah. Sheila. So yeah. what is the most common hazard that you are finding that individuals are facing? Uh, workload. Workload is very high on the list of hazards. Um, is that tied around COVID? Is that no? It's generally COVID? always been workload. Um, high workloads is a, is a big stressor. Um, I think it. I think um, typically it would average around about a 60 70 percent score. Wow. So having, just having too much to do and not enough time in which to do it. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, if any of you do have any questions, um, this is to the listeners, then please do feel free to post them in the chat box and Sheila will answer those for you. Um, just remind you uh, again that this webinar is being recorded so you can listen to it again and you can share the link um, amongst your network, which is available through the Chamber Webinar Library. So just going to move over to the next slide and back over to you, Sheila. Okay, so when we're looking at the size of the problem, um, we can look at claims in the UK um, on insurance, uh, not insurance claims, the tribunal claims, and typically a psychological injury claim ranges between £4,000 and £10,000 per claim and has been known to go as high as 50 k Now, I don't know if any of you are aware, but in the mid, uh, quite a few years ago, the mid-2000s, uh, in France, three directors um, were jailed for causing work conditions so bad 35 employees um, within their organisation took their own lives in just one year and what they did is they weren't able to um, get rid of staff and they needed to restructure and um, so they created um, um, a culture of harassment and bullying um, that caused undue stress um, to a number of people um, within just 12 months 35 took their life. Now, Australia is, is very far ahead of us um, in terms of workplace mental health, and they're actually just bringing in specific legislation um, that addresses everything that I'm talking about today. And I, I would see that if I had to hazard a guess that the UK will probably be playing catch up in about eight to 10 years time, um, maybe a little bit sooner with um, the impact of mental health with COVID, who knows. Um, but in Australia, interesting, look, looking at this statistic, and this is quite old, um, claims for psychological injury between 2014 and 2015 increased by 53% um, compared to only 3.5% increase over the same period of time for physical injuries. So, you know, it's, it's absolutely a real problem. Um, and whether as a director or a business leader, you think it's, oh, it's all just fluffy white clouds, people just need to pull themselves together, be more resilient, um, be stronger. Um, it, it, it exists and as, as employers we need to put a structure um, and policies and support in place um, to help people um, through um, those different periods of the continuum. Now again a statistic you may or may not all be familiar with but the latest Deloitte report that came out um, in October um, the UK's estimate that's October 2019 um, the cost of mental ill health uh, is estimated to be around £42 billion in the UK, around about 1700 per employee. Um, and there's a number that's, you know, banded around of one in four people in the workplace will suffer with mental health, um, one in six globally. That one in four, that's 25% of your, of your workforce at some point will struggle. Um, and there's been, you know, many studies, um, and there was a Harvard study, um, that shows that, you know, the return on investment for impactful and well-structured workplace well-being is five to one. So that's a massive um, ROI um, on, on well-being of, of, of the employees in the organisation, not to mention, you know, the increase in productivity, etc, etc, because happy employees are very productive employees. Um, could you have the next slide, um, please, Melinda? Excellent. Okay, so kind of coming on to codes of practice, as I say, we've got in the, in the UK, we've got the fact that 
um, we've got the Health and Safety at Work Act, we've got the Health and Safety Regulations, and they do state that, you know, we have a legal requirement um, to mitigate risk, identify risk um, within the workplace. And there are also another of other different codes of practice um, that have come to the fore in recent years. Um, one of those is the Thriving at Work report, which was commissioned by the then Prime Minister um, Theresa May, who I know, you know was on a, a Thames Valley Chamber webinar just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and that report threw out um, a number of recommendations, including six core standards and four enhanced standards around the uh, workplace mental health that we should be doing. Um, in addition to that, um, we've got the health and safety executive. There are published there six um, areas of um, psychological hazards um, that, again, we should be um, addressing. Trevor's saying his sound is gone. Um, don't know if anybody else's is gone or if anybody else can still hear. So okay, I think most people are okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, so yeah. In terms of the health and safety executive, the stress management standards. Again, they they cite six of the eight hazards that we were just looking at earlier, um, in terms of what we should be um, risk managing. Okay. Um, and then I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but there's a new ISO standard that comes into play um, next year. Um, it's currently a draft document. Um, and again, this is looking specifically at occupational health and safety management. So it sits under the current health and safety management um, standard for occupational health, um, but it's specifically focused on psychological health and safety at work and managing those risks. And again, the platform Flourish DX has been designed in line with 45003. So I've taken all of the different recommendations and the elements of the standard and we've implemented those into the platform so that you can have a very simple data-driven approach to workplace wellbeing. So there's enough codes of practice out there for employers to know what they should be doing and they all say pretty much the same thing. And we need to be having as employers a systemic approach to workplace mental health. And we need to be risk assessing that in exactly the same way that we would a physical hazard. The business processes exist, they're not new to us. Um, we just need to ensure that we adopt the same policies and the processes and business procedures for mental well-being in the workplace as we do physical well-being in the workplace okay because with all of these standards out there you know if we're doing this as a reactive rather than as a proactive um approach you know we're leaving ourselves open as employers to huge claims for psychological injury um so you know we've got employers have got less places to hide um in terms of stress in the workplace okay uh, can we do the next slide please Narinda? So again, I just wanted to go back to this shared responsibility um, for the workplace mental health. You know, and I said before, you know, as an employer, you can create the best working environment possible, um, but you can still get people that will insist on working themselves to the bone. Um, and that might be, you know, until, you know, answering emails at one or two o'clock in the morning. That may be because they're having problems with sleep. They've got problems in their home life with relationships, etc. So, you know, what we want to do is we want to help and support employees as well to take personal responsibility um, to influence their own mental health using um, these five different pillars um, that contribute to uh, well-being, um, which is known as PERMA. Um, if you can pop onto the next slide, please. So within PERMA, we're looking at the things here that can all have an impact on how we feel. So if we're feeling positive emotions, we tend to be feeling happy. If we're engaged in what we're doing, uh, we'll be productive. You know, if we've got good relationships either in the workplace or in our home life, we're feeling positive. And if we feel like we've got meaningfulness and we're contributing to a greater good, be it at home or at work, again, 
it makes us feel good about ourselves. And if we feel like we've had this sense of accomplishment, it makes us feel great. And traditionally, workplace mental health is around the, the kind of the main pillars of physical um, health that support mental health, which is great. But we also need to look at this um, kind of more emotional stuff. OK, so if we go on to the next slide, please. So what we're looking to do is to take this um, preventative approach um, within um, workplace mental health. Um, so we recognise that, you know, there's a few of you that, that, that identified them straight off that, you know, Psychological hazards are a major challenge to health and safety and well-being, but we need to go through this process when we are looking at addressing that. So we need to look to um, identify the hazards. We need to look at how we assess the risk. We need to look at how we control those risks. And then we need to check the effectiveness of those risks. So, for example, you would not leave a forklift truck in the middle of an aisleway in um, the warehouse you know you would have a process within which to identify that hazard assess the risk of somebody falling over it and breaking an arm and a leg do something to put that right and make sure that it doesn't kind of happen again or that 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 um, process change has been effective and during that time you would have a consultation with with the um, employees um, so it needs to be a very consultative and collaborative process um, so if we go on to the next slide, Naminda, so for example, if we identified a hazard um, such as, oh sorry, can we just go back one? Yeah, so we're talking here, no, sorry, there we go, um, about this risk assessment approach. Um, what we have in the workplace um, is this labour force, okay, and this labour force can potentially be as much as 70% of our um, outgoings in the business. So we'll have labour that will be, you know, a massive, um, massive overhead, so labour and salaries. And then we'll have plant and equipment, maybe machinery, and we may have cars and fleet management. And we talk about our people being our greatest assets, okay? Um, however, we find that, you know, we buy a one million pound piece of plant or equipment or a 500,000 pound machine, we put a maintenance contract, we have a service contract, we look after that piece of equipment, we look after that asset to get the best performance out of it and to make it last as long as we possibly can and that it runs efficiently. Uh, we do the same with our company cars, we get our company cars, we have fleet managers that are there to make sure that the cars are serviced on time, that they're looked after on time um, so that we we keep the value in those cars so that when we go to resell them we've not and our, our assets haven't depreciated and there's a lot of talk i see on linkedin and you know our people are our greatest assets but there is a lot of talk and not enough um, action um, in terms of taking a more supportive and preventative approach for employees so you know where is the support for staff where is the maintenance for staff you know, we're, we're, what are we doing as organisations to do this? If we're, if we're your greatest assets, why are you not treating us in a similar way, taking the same approach with us as you would plant equipment, cars and other um, valuable assets within the organisation? Sorry, we could move on to that next slide, Dominda. Again, that was just a slide to demonstrate, you know, the direct labour costs in the business um, and, you know, staff costs. It's, it's the biggest... One of the biggest numbers that you'll have in your business yet because we're not necessarily always seeing sickness absence mental ill health as a figure on our bottom line sheets we tend to think it doesn't exist okay so we can move on to the next one okay so what we need to be doing is we need to be looking at risk assessing the organization OK, now, not all stress is bad. We need a degree of stress to get us um, through things um, and to keep us motivated. Um, but physical hazards, we join a workplace. We, we, you know, we join a warehouse. We're given 
manual handling training, but in construction we might get some working at heights training, working in confined spaces training, which fire extinguisher to use when a fire goes off. But what training do we give as standard when somebody joins our organisation to say, we are, you know, what is mental health? What is depression? What is anxiety? How do you cope with that? Where do you go to for that support? You know, how many of us have that in terms of um, support um, in the organisation uh, from the outset? How many of you have that as part of your induction process in the workplace? So we need to be getting the training around these psychological hazards as we do um, physical hazards. OK, um, and using the risk assessments um, that we have in the platform around the work design survey helps us to identify which, ideas, which areas of work design we do well um, that are optimal, which are the areas that we're pretty neutral on, um, so we're just pottering along, and which are the areas that are flagging as being at risk and at being at the um, the area that are causing the most stress in the workplace. And what we can do once we identify those risks is we can look to focus on specific areas. Um, so focus specifically on change consultation or role clarity or workload and see what we can do to make those things better. And this doesn't have to be complicated, okay? So for example, we did a um, case study with an organisation that delivered training and development and workload came up as a, as a big factor. Now, once we kind of got into the discussion around the workload, it wasn't that workload was consistently um, an issue. Workload was an issue um, when the training department were receiving requests to train people um, at four o'clock in the afternoon and having to put training programmes on at nine o'clock the following morning. What they did is they identified that through the risk assessment process. They talked about it. Um, and they basically just put a service level agreement in place that gave the training team a three day notice period. The problem went away. So I think what we get within the workplace, using that as an example, is often people will carry on working in exactly the same way. And they will continue to complain in exactly the same way and be stressed about certain things rather than speaking up and um, making those simple changes. This facilitates that. Um, having these conversations, having these committees facilitates that uh, and helps us to create um, a better work environment. You want to go on to the next slide, please, Melinda? So, you know, this is, you know, once we've identified the risk, this is what we would do. We would look at this hierarchy of controls and look at how can we eliminate those risks, yeah? So going back to the example I've just given you there, you know, we identified that workload was an issue. We're not going to be able to uh, eliminate workload but we could eliminate the condition that was causing the stress around that workload issue, yeah? And we redesigned the work environment, yeah? And we changed the policy by putting a service level agreement in place, and then we let everybody know about it, um, et cetera, et cetera. So there's ways in which you can um, approach this, um, and the further down the, you know, the, the, the funnel you go there, you know, the less effective it goes, the best thing is to be able to eliminate the condition that's that's causing the threat, okay? But it's just to show that it is actually possible, okay? And that's the things like training, communication, it doesn't have to be complicated, it doesn't have to be mentally, you know, related, it's about the work environment and taking away the things that cause pain. So if we can move on to the next slide. So, you know, we'll do our risk assessments, we will have a look at the results, and then what we can start to do as an organisation, and this will look familiar to quite a few of you, is a wellbeing management plan or a risk assessment plan, okay? And then what we can do here is we've got the department or the business that we've done the, you know, the risk assessment on. We've looked at the risk factors that have come out of that um, survey. And then we're looking at the actions that are required. We're forming a team. We're putting some actions in place. We've discussed it. We're on the same page and we're actually starting to move things forward. We can actually start to make progress in specific areas of the business that are causing specific elements of stress to specific people. And we can start to remove that. So it's a very targeted, very systemic um, and very effective approach um, because 
it's it's our business it's our people it's our feedback so we can then actually start to make some impactful difference and also by having it in this type of risk assessment approach we've got senior leadership involved it's on the risk management plan we're putting it on the same agenda as physical health so it needs to have resource allocated to it be that people be that money be that time um it needs to start then being resolved um throughout the business so if we move on to the next slide that takes us back again to this integrated model of workplace mental health and i'm hoping kind of having said that you can see here why we need to be doing this element of preventing harm as i said we do some flourishing we do some mil uh, illness, illness mitigation um but without this bit in the middle we're, we're aiming in the dark here potentially in the with the health promotion stuff um and then we're just picking people up when they fall um so this part in the middle is really, really important um, because with this part in the middle, we can then start to look at promoting workers' psychological well-being and preventing harm. We can do that effectively, specific to the business that we work in. OK, so if we look at kind of what the benefits are and what we should be doing with employees, if we can pop on to the next slide, please, Melinda. Oh. Um, so what we've been looking at is awareness and education. So e-learning um, for all employees, not just people who go on a mental health first aid course. What we want to do is provide education across the whole business. So we've got a suite of tools um, that are built in that have um, 60 modules around mental health. We have lots of information around sleep health. We've got e-learning around PERMA. Um, so all of this e-learning is built in, uh, it's all small animated videos, two to five minutes each video, discussion guides, blended learning to allow you to start to develop that culture of awareness across the whole organisation. Um, also at well-being tools so people some of the people on the call will have come across apps um, that promote well-being you may have subscription for these apps with your employees um, unmind or headspace or calm and these are all fantastic tools for well-being and give us excellent things to help us with relaxation um, again we've got well-being tools that will do daily check-ins we'll do mood trackers we've got a digital coaching bot we can build in all the signposting tools, all the crisis support, all the mental health internal supports, uh, EAP systems. So all of that's built into the platform. And then where we really kind of get the good information, where we get the really useful stuff are the survey tools. OK, um, so with the survey tools, we have anonymized surveys so we can push these surveys out. Um, to all staff and we don't see any results on these surveys until we get a minimum of eight responses and um, that allows people to answer in all kind of honesty their, their, their responses are between them and the platform as an employer you only get to see the aggregate information and um, so we can get honest feedback uh, we can get real-time feedback and the individual is given specific feedback um, on the personal survey results so we do that around the work environment we do that around PERMA, so we may feed back to them based on their responses that they need to do a little bit more work on their relationships and then we provide them with training and support on how they can do that. Um, and then another element of the platform is a um, character strength survey that we use under license from the VIA Institute. And again, that allows um, us to be able to work and understand the character strengths of the people within our organisation. OK, For a if we move on to the next slide. Then. Yeah, um, just a quick question, um, yeah. Sheila. How are you finding companies promoting these um, tools to their employees or making them aware of these? In terms of this, this so... Yeah, so are you finding people are telling you about their company, um, mentioning, you know, the, the, the e-learning um, tool available, the wellbeing tool, you know, having those apps available on your phone? 
Yeah, I mean, companies take a different approach. Some companies just have a, you know, a standalone learning management system. Some people will have learning management systems and tools. And organisations will be doing one or two or all of these things, mm -hmm. but they won't necessarily all be um, intertwined. Mm. So they're not kind of working with each other to build up this bigger picture. Um, what we do with um, with our clients is that we we walk them through this whole process. We do the policies. We look at you know how we develop that culture within the organisation, develop a team, and then really bring this on board so we can get as much engagement as possible, um, and people really get the benefits out of using the using the products and the platforms. So from an employer's perspective, you know, once the employees have done those surveys, we then get one thing that is absolutely missing in the whole mental health workplace piece, and that's data. Data mm. analytics. Data, because, because it's not been, you know, it's only kind of been a more recent development the last, I don't know, eight to ten years in the UK of really building that awareness piece of mental health in the workplace. Um, the, the, you know, data isn't it's it, there's not a lot of it about um however what we're starting to do with the survey tools is to build up that whole data analytics so we can do gap analysis we can focus on areas of risk we can demonstrate an audit trail uh, we can do a whole organization approach with our risk management plans but even more um important i think is that we can start to actually set and track KPIs. Remember before I said that, you know, a return on investment is, you know, of a well-executed plan is five to one. Okay. So we can set track, set and track KPIs on, you know, what is our current sickness cost? What are our current sickness days? Has that improved over time? Um, you know, what are the numbers on intention to quit? So there are a number of outcomes that we can look at and that we can track so that actually we can start to set some real business goals, um, and quantifiable goals um, and cost savings and demonstrate um, how these programs um, done well can benefit the business. Um, so Great. thanks, Gina. Yeah, it's it's really important that you know we get to use data and not just generic data that's like the, the one in four, the 42 billion, you know, the numbers that we see on a regular basis across LinkedIn. We want data that's relevant to our business, to our organisation, um, because that's what matters to us um, as employers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and the other thing with the, with the platform, again, I'm not mentioned it there, but, you know, because of the um, nature of the data that we are collecting, you know, all of our data is ISO 27001 secure as well. Okay. Um, so we go on to the next slide. Is it the one after this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because we've just done that one now. And then is that one? Yes. Yeah, I think Rachel, Rachel's just asked on the mental well-being pl plan that she understands the value of that at an organisational level, but how is that adapted for individuals? Should we have personal plans? I think absolutely, Rachel. I think, you know, you can further extend that down and one of your outcomes from your risk management plan could well be that we, uh, that as a business, you start to introduce um, personal management plans. Um, you know, for example, sleep might you know say you're running i don't know a driving business or you know sleeps maybe a factor you've got shift workers you know we might have a personal plan there to do some workshops on sleep we might then decide to like we have a performance improvement plan for our um, performance in the workplace why wouldn't we have one to help people to develop on a personal level in terms of well-being so you know that that can be another outcome um, that you introduce specific to your business it might not be relevant for all businesses at all levels and um, that's certainly that's something that could come out in the kind of uh, well-being committee discussions okay um so just just kind of coming towards the end of, of the session today you know going back to the whole compliance issue um, around um, these different codes of practice that are coming in going back to you know employees um, claims for psychological injury um, the system will also um, you know establish 
a full picture of our approach to well-being, well-being and will grade us on our maturity um, of our platform. Um, so it takes, this, this flourish factor takes into account the key, the key um, parts of the ISO standard and um, it will score you on how well you're doing against those key elements of the standard so that we've always got something to attain to in terms of the governance, in terms of the risk assessment, the risk mitigation, how well we're doing, how we compare to um, other people within our industry. And again, this data set builds up over time. And if we are looking at fully ISO documented stamp compliance and audited um, annual audits around this, you know, we've got a full audit trail in there. We can demonstrate everything that we're doing as a business um, to meet the requirements of the best in terms of codes of practice out there. Um, and it is, you know, you would do this for physical health. We talk the talk, physical health is just as good as, just as important as, uh, sorry, mental health is just as important as physical health. People are our greatest assets, but we don't demonstrate that with action. Um, and that's really what we're very passionate about getting people to do um, and just taking the systems level approach, getting it on the business agenda, getting it in front of senior leadership team and talking to them as, a, you know, presenting it as a business case with some real tangible numbers um, so that we can demonstrate that workplace mental health is more than fluffy white clouds and people needing to man up and be tough. Okay. So next slide, please, Nalinda. So um, one of the things you might want to do um, as a follow up from this session is a workplace mental health audit. So we've got an online tool um, and with this online tool, you can just do it's 15 questions. Um, I'll get Nalinda to put the link out for you after. Um, and it's just 15 simple questions that perform a simple gap analysis. You put your details in and it will email you your results straight away. Um, and you can see then where your gaps are. So it's, it's an audit slash um, gap analysis for you. Um, and that will tell you the kind of the critical things that you're missing um, and what are the nice to haves um, that would have you kind of as, you know, the employer of choice elements, if you will. Um, you know, if you're taking this back into your workplace to talk to your management or your senior leadership team, you know, what, what we find when we talk about um, this approach to workplace mental health is that it can sometimes be really difficult to change the ingrained thinking that exists that, well, we've got an EAP system, we've got mental health first aid, we're doing mental health in the workplace, but you're not you are picking people up you're doing part of the process but not the whole process you wouldn't um you know you wouldn't put in you don't put first aiders in there ready to kind of you know you know fix broken arms after they occur you just wouldn't let that happen so why do you why is it acceptable that we let our employees fall over because we the work environment isn't um as, as good as it could be for them um so one of the other things that we've got, which you can download off our website, and I think the window will show our contact details um, after, is a, is a pretty comprehensive guide to um, taking this approach um, within the business. And what we've done with the guide is we've made it a step-by-step -step approach, you know, and, and doing something like this isn't just as simple as, as putting in a digital platform and walking away. You know, there's, it's, it's a cultural change, it's getting senior leadership teams on board, it's making that business case and it's driving that forward with the right team and the right people at the right level um, with representation across the whole organisation from senior leadership down to join the warehouse um, because it impacts everybody across the business. Okay, um, so we need to do that to be able to do it well, otherwise it just becomes um, a bit of a waste. Um, so on to the last slide, you'll be glad to hear. <laughs> So what I'd like you to do, actually, it's actually on the slide there, mentalhealthaudit.com. Um, so you can hop onto that and um, assess what you've already got in place. Um, if you haven't already done so, I would familiarise yourself with the resources from the Health and Safety Executive Stress Management Standards and the Farmer Stevenson Thriving at Work Report. Um, I, again, I can provide these as downloads to the window. 
Um, but you can easily, again, you can find them by Googling them um, and there's downloadable PDFs um, online and start to have a look at the ISO 45003 um, standard. There is a draft document that can be bought from BSI uh, PDF for £12. Um, so you can get that from their standards workshop. Um, and it's it's just really good to kind of arm yourself with that because, you know, it's an ISO standard that will become the de facto global language um, around mental health in the workplace and best practice. Um, the key thing, if you're going to be doing this, you know, it won't really happen without leadership support. You know, trying to push a rock uphill with leadership not being on board, you will, it will be painful. It will be very painful. Um, you need to get your workplace policies in place. You need to have workplace policies that are specifically committed to psychosocial risk management. Um, so these need to be different policies than your current um, stuff that you've got in there. Um, you need your risk registers, again, specifically around the psychosocial risks and hazards. Um, and... If you've got that leadership support, you've got that business case, you've got it on the risk registers, you will get that top level commitment from um, the, you know, the senior leadership team in terms of time, in terms of money and in terms of training to deal with those hazards that have been, have been raised. OK, um, so if you want to know more, um, I don't know whether you go through Narendra or come to me directly, um, but I'm happy to talk more um, on the subject matter. Um, I could talk for three days on it. Um, but I will, I've got an hour today, so I won't. <laughs> um, but that's kind of the end of my session for today. So if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Great. Thank you very much, Sheila, um, for delivering today's webinar. It's been very interesting, very engaging. So you've really educated us uh, really well on, on this hot topic of conversation. So thank you, thank you very much. Um, as you can see, Sheila is sharing her contact details there. So do get in contact with her. Um, you mentioned the, um, the tool available on your website. So David has mentioned, yeah, the audit tool. Um, yes. So if you post it on social media, tag the chamber into it, we can reshare it so our followers um, no and members, non-members can actually access that and anything mm -hmm. else that you wanna be um, letting others know about. Yeah. So um, yeah, um, please do visit BMR Health and Wellbeing's website um, listeners um, for more information on the work they do, the support they provide. Um, there's a number of training courses on there as well um, that you can access um, and you can contact Sheila directly. Please do link with her on LinkedIn or any other social media channels that she's on. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning and in the middle, this webinar has been recorded so you can listen to it again you can share uh, the link amongst your network and it will appear in our weekly mailer which will be next week. Um, just going to quickly move over to a couple of chamber slides. Um, so this is the chamber of the Thames Managed Chamber of Commerce membership model. It's um, designed to attract a business depending on the level of exposure required. So I can see today we've got quite a few non-members listening in. So if you do have any questions about um, the benefits and services we provide, how you can engage, then please do contact me. Um, and I'm um, here to discuss um, membership with you, or I can pass you over to um, a, a member of my team. Um, so again, here is um, Sheila's contact details. So please do contact her if you've got any questions. Um, any questions now you can ask through the chat box. We do still have a few minutes. Um, but I would like to thank all the listeners uh, for listening in today. David, thank you very much for your feedback. That's great. Um, yeah, Sheila, is there anything else that you would like to say? Anything? I think I've spoken enough. <laughs> okay. I know. Excellent. Thank you yeah. so much. Oh, um, so Lindsay saying thank you. Thank you very much for listening. Um, so I think, yeah, we're all done. I'll just give it a few more seconds. So if anyone's got any questions, they can ask them in the chat box. So if, if anyone wants to speak to me directly, they don't want to speak through the chat, then I'm, I'm happy to. Yes. Press yes. That as well. That's great. And you're on LinkedIn, Sheila. I'm connected with I am, you. So yeah, I'm in know? LinkedIn, um, both uh, BMI Health and Wellbeing and um, as Sheila Lord. Um, also, my business partner, Anne Marie Robinson. You can find us um, under, yeah, you'll find us in LinkedIn. That's perfect.
Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much, listeners. And thank you, Sheila. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye, Bye. everybody.